There's a 90s film experiencing a renaissance at the moment, 1993's Falling Down, starring Michael Douglas at the height of his powers and an incredible ensemble cast of wild characters directed by Joel Schumacher. It might be a 90s flick, but to me it's well within the canon of the great 80s action films like Die Hard, but way, way darker with a tragic and conflicted protagonist on an inevitable path to self-destruction. I've seen loads of videos popping up on YouTube recently about it, so I didn't bat an eye when I saw this image. And it took me a minute to realise that this doesn't actually happen in the film. When the guys approach him, he is sat down on that pile of concrete, holding his shoe and drinking a coke. So this was a photograph made on the set, and it's become incredibly iconic. In the movies, they call this key art photography, and back in the day, before everyone became obsessed with Photoshop and close-ups of actors' heads, there wasn't much difference between the stills photography and the key art photography. So I started to hunt for behind-the-scenes stills photographs, and although I found some prints from Falling Down for sale on Etsy and on some auction websites, only the studio was credited. Not crediting the stills photographer seems to be common practice even now. Using IMDB, I found the photographer's name, Christine M. Loss, and it turns out she's photographed some incredible films as a stills photographer, including Raging Bull and Flatliners. But today I'll focus on her stills from the film Falling Down. So this photograph of Michael Douglas I find really interesting, because it's just in the film after he's had that first kind of battle with the kind of hoodlums trying to get his briefcase, and he's kind of fought them both off. It's just when he's going to turn and throw his bat at one of the guys running away. And what I find really interesting about this stills photograph as kind of a photojournalist is that it looks so real. The horizon's a bit wonky. His placement's good. It's obviously in the negative space there of the grass and you know, his little flat top haircut isn't breaking that edge. It's all very nicely lined up. But the body language is so strange. It's so twisted and odd. His facial expression is wild. If you zoom into it, you can kind of see, although he's just like won a fight against these two gang guys, he looks really scared. Now, when it comes to the kind of emotion that's going on in this photograph, you'd think he just like beaten the two guys off. Would you beat me off? Yes, but no more than that. You know what I mean? And they're kind of running away, but he doesn't look like angry. He looks terrified. You kind of zoom into his facial expression here. He looks really scared and weird one. Like, I don't know how many of you got a background of getting into street fights, but um, the ones that you won, sometimes you'd kind of be upset afterwards, even though you'd won. Maybe it's kind of the adrenaline dump or it's just it was very stressful and you're not used to that kind of stress. Sometimes in that situation, even if you win the fight, you can feel like crying. So yeah, he looks, he looks terrified. But anyway, as a photograph in itself, I love it. Again, it ticks all the boxes for kind of a photojournalistic image. You know, for going, this is Michael Douglas. It's just such a strange composition. He's got his like, you know, his sword and his shield. He's in this strange pose. Yeah, really, really wacky. And, and just a great kind of real fake moment, if that's right. So this photograph is incredible. In the scene just after the kind of the drive-by gone wrong, and you see this mural kind of in the background as it pans to Michael Douglas's character, and it's kind of hinted to in the background. It just shows how great Christine M. Loss was as a stills photographer, because again, for me, it just feels like a very authentic reportage kind of moment. Compositionally, he's standing within the mural, composed beautifully with his head placed perfectly in the negative space, but he's not of it. He's alone, he's outside of their reality, somehow loose of the confines. Like at the start of the film, he is trapped like everyone else in his car and then just walks. Which is funny, right? Because at the time I remember there was an REM music video for Everybody Hurts who depicts people stuck in traffic. And eventually they all leave their cars and walk as well. Pretty coincidental that that music video and this movie were made around the same time, featuring a very similar scene. And, you know, some people have said that they both took from Fellini's film Eight and a Half, but, you know, if they did, how come at that exact moment across those couple of months in 1993? Anyway, weird. So, you know, there's D. Fenz's character kind of singled out, just like in the film, and kind of, you know, we know he was, like, made an example of. But there's another example there in Christ, 
But that graffiti, that's not Christ. That's a mural dedicated to a 19-year-old gang member, Anthony Chico Barrera, who was elevated in his own death to hero status through the mural and depicted in a Christ-like pose. But he was also being investigated by the LAPD for a murder of a 16-year-old boy himself. So how crazy is that? Like, did the filmmakers know what that mural meant when they stood defense in front of it? Or the fact that they had that kind of iconic kind of shootout with the drive-by gang in front of that mural? Part of me knows that doing documentary, like weird things can align, like right place, right time, some sort of symbolism. But maybe it's also possible that you can have like a fake moment, like a movie you've made up, but if you film it in the real world, there are overlaps with real elements and real things that have meaning. Whether you mean them to or not, they have some kind of connection. Um, there are some really fun photographs, I guess, between takes of Michael Douglas rocking some sunglasses. And it's when he's in his kind of black combat gear running around with his bag of guns mode. And yeah, he looks like a badass. And on the subject of glasses, um, D. Fenn starts out in these sort of super dorky clubmaster glasses, and at some point during the course of the film they get broken. This portrait of Michael Douglas looking to camera is great. It's such a tight crop, really in your face and threatening, and I found two versions of it online, and I think I prefer this one. It's the kind of slightly wider shot. Obviously they're probably both a bit wider. This is what was available that I could find, and it's all for me about the expression. This one, it feels a bit forced. It feels a bit pantomime villain. There's something scowling about it that makes me not really feel it's authentic as it could be. Whereas this one, this one has something else going on. You know, I know this might sound crazy, but over 24 years of photographing people, I can really zone in on tiny details, like the shape of someone's mouth, the creases around their eyes. And I think I can pick up on disingenuous emotion quite well. So if I show you both of these portraits, you know, what do you think? For me, the one on the right is way more real. Now, so as a like documentary photographer, I don't analyze reality. I just take photographs of what's going on and like maybe afterwards I'll look through the photographs and see if there's any kind of symbolism that's happened. Well, you know, right? On a film set, it's all been thought up. Things have been written into a script. Clothes have been acquired by costuming. Props have been made. Things could mean things. And for me, that single cracked lens could have represented um, D. Fenz's character's ability to see the world in a different way, you know? It's literally like he's been on this journey and part of his vision has become cracked and distorted. After all, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And we've seen him earlier in the film sat up on top of his throne. So if he's able to see the world in a different way, it kind of explains some of the motifs of the film to do with consumerism. You know, when he's preaching to people trying to munch down their burgers in the restaurant scene, he's ranting about the swindle of modern consumerism. But everyone else just stares at him like he's crazy. They cannot see it. And to me, there's a shamanic element to Defense's character. He's been kind of knocked out of everyday life. He's kind of off kilter. And now he's seen things, another side to our reality. And now he's trying to impart this wisdom back to the tribe. But they do not want to know. There's this point of no return speech he gives to his ex-wife, where he says about, I'm on the other side of the moon now. I'm out of contact and everyone's going to have to wait for me to pop out. And it's like, yeah, you know, he's, he's gone. He's somewhere else. This Uzi shot, again, I said at the start about kind of 80s action films, and you just feel like, you know, this could be Stallone, couldn't it? This could be Schwarzenegger, this could be whatever. But we're in the kind of this sort of post-80s action hero stage where everyone's getting slighter. Sort of starts, I guess, off with um, Bruce Willis and Die Hard. And it's just ticking all those notes for me. So here's this image. And this became like the iconic cover image of the DVD, and it is one of the stills photographs taken by Christine. And there's something really surreal about it, because this doesn't actually happen in the film, I said earlier. He sat on it, but to have posed him like this, kind of elevated, again, it's a knockback for me, another thing to do with shamanism. Like, he's on this higher thing, he's been elevated, he's maybe seeing the world in a kind of slightly different way to everyone else. Um, he's got his briefcase, and at the start, when he's fighting the, the two gang guys, the way he knocks the guy's knife out of the way and hits the bat, it's almost like it's his shield and it's his sword. And the fact that he starts the film with just a shield, and from, you know, 
conflict to conflict, it progresses his weapon. So it starts off as a bat, then it becomes a knife. And before you know it, it's like a rocket launcher. And, you know, his character, he worked for the defense department in America. He has a shield for defense. His character's name is Defense. And it's like the story of someone who goes from a defensive position to an offensive position. But yeah, I think it's a wonderful shot. And again, I'm really annoyed that I couldn't really get any kind of high-res copies of these photographs. Most of these photos that I found, they were all like on like Etsy sites, whatever, really low res. People had signed them, other people had printed them, totally unaccredited. I doubt Christine's getting any money for them because usually the contracts they signed, that was it, they were doing the job. And to me, it's a real shame that I can't see any of these in kind of high resolution. And after doing some research, like Christine's in her 80s now. She doesn't have an Instagram account. From what I can find, she doesn't have a website. Like all this amazing legacy of her stills photography from like Raging Bull, Flatliners, Falling Down, who knows what else, like that might be lost. And that's kind of her legacy. So look, here's a call to action to you guys. Like find Christine and just reach out to her and say, hey, if you're a hipster dude, you know Instagram, say, hey, can we make an Instagram page for you? I'll upload your work, we'll put it out there. Or if you could make her a website or something like that, wouldn't that be amazing? Just because people would have access to all this great work. Because at the moment, literally, it's like 600 pixel wide scratched up uh, scanned impressed photographs and who knows what else. And again, this is the era of film. Like We're just seeing what was picked by those people who were kind of in the production, who knows what amazing photographs didn't make the cut. And on a purely selfish level, right, I love that image of Michael Douglas characters stood in with the mural and the mural of the kind of Jesus S figure in the car. I think that's a wonderful shot. And again, super low res online. You know what? I would like to own a copy of that print. I would like to have that on my office wall. I think it's freaking awesome. So yeah, on a purely selfish level, it'd be great to find her just to get, get a nice print of that.